Hey everybody, Gary here with Guitar Tricks, and in this video, I'm gonna give you five tips to stop sounding like a beginner guitar player. From my perspective as someone that has lots of students that I see every week on Zoom, used to be more in person, but now mostly virtual, but it's cool because I get to teach people all over the world, which is pretty sweet. I get to see people that are at various different skill levels. Some of my students are pretty advanced and there's just something that I might be more advanced at that I could help them with and vice versa. Some of my students are complete beginners and some of them are at this point where they've been playing for a while, but they're still not quite ready to maybe play in a band or perform songs live, right? They're trying to get past that beginner stage. And that's what I would say the beginner stage is, is like you've learned some things, but you're not quite ready to, you know, play out with a band or perform your songs for people without feeling like, oh, I'm making mistakes. I don't feel confident, that kind of thing. So how do we get to that place, right? Well, it doesn't have to be by playing really complicated music, right? We all know artists that play simple, but sound so professional, right? They don't sound beginner. Everything is solid. There, you know, there's a lot of emotion coming through. There's a good groove. There's good feel. Everything sounds exactly as it should sound. We're not hearing any like mistakes or things going wrong, right? So we're gonna talk a lot about that. What does it take to get to that? Before I share these tips with you, please go ahead and click that subscribe button so that you get all the latest and greatest content from Guitar Tricks. And if you wanna be notified of any new lesson, be sure to tap the bell and please let us know in the comments what kinds of future lessons you'd like to see. That's where we're always looking to see what to do next. All right, so tip number one, develop your ear. So music is first and foremost sound, just like language, right? Language is sound first, writing comes later. As kids, we learn to speak and have conversations with our parents before we ever went to school to learn about the alphabet and to learn about grammar and to learn how to spell and read, right? That came after we already felt comfortable listening and responding verbally. It's the same way through music. So a lot of beginners that I see learn either just by tab, just by YouTube videos, and it's kind of this paint by numbers thing where they're just putting their fingers in the right place. So the best way to learn, the the I would say the ultimate skill as a musician at the top of the pyramid is your ear. So how do you develop your ear? So listening to lots of music and trying to learn music by ear. And you wanna start with things that are really, really simple, little simple riffs, right? If you hear a riff that goes like this, that's a little riff, right? So what you wanna do instead of going to the tab is you wanna to try to figure out what is actually happening there. So if a riff is difficult to figure out, the best thing to do is slow it down. So check it out on this YouTube video or on any YouTube video where you're listening to something you wanna figure out by ear, click that gear icon, slow it down, rewind, play a little section, try to sing it. Don't, 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 pause it, take it one little piece at a time, try to play it, press play again. And then if you wanna get more serious about figuring things out by ear, check out the program Amazing Slow Downer. I've been using this program probably for about 15 years. What's great about it is you could slow things down by a percentage point down to 20% speed. You could change the key. You could loop just one second or one half a second at a time just to focus on one little piece of riff. So there's so much technology available to help us learn by ear now. Right, and this is before trying to figure out what scale is it in, all that stuff. You're just trying to recreate the sound and all the little details. So if I went and I added a little vibrato on that last note, that's something you hear with your ear and that gives you some articulations. You're hearing how I connect each note. Right, whereas if you're looking at tab, you might go <laughs> right, it's gonna, you're not getting the actual feel and the tone. 
So the thing about the guitar is that you could play any note on average in three different places. So when you're first starting out, don't worry so much about if you're playing it in the right spot. Try to play it in different places and see what feels most comfortable. And then once you learn different scale shapes and things like that, you'll know, you know where it sits within the key and what your favorite places are and that kind of thing. But in the beginning, just try to get the right notes. Maybe it's a lick. So there, you're hearing me slide into the note. And then sliding into that note, right? And then some vibrato, right? So you're gonna try to recreate that sound. It's a trial and error. You might wanna sing the phrase first. Do da dee da boom, be da dun dun. So now you're making connection between your ear and the guitar. Do da dee do do. So now it's like you're just singing the phrase. It takes longer to learn music by ear, but it's so much deeper because now you have made a connection between your ear and where your fingers go. Whereas tab and someone just telling you, put your finger there and do that, there's no connection between here and here, or it's a vague connection. And then maybe it's a simple chord progression. Maybe you hear this. And then what you try to do is go, okay, so if I sing maybe a strong note, if I find a strong note for each chord. Bum, bum. What I ended up singing there was the root notes. Then I get the root notes. Okay, now is that a major or a minor chord? Major. This would be minor. Baum is the next chord. There's major. There's minor major again. Ba, that's the next chord. So I got my root note, major or minor. There's minor, there's major, it was minor. And then, ba, more ba. And then that one, major or minor. Nope. Yeah, so we had C major, G major, A minor, F, right? This is how I learn music. And the more I learn music this way, the stronger and stronger my ear gets, right? And that's also going to help you when you're playing with others, trying to respond in the moment. You're hearing things and you're feeling comfortable trying to find them on the fretboard instead of saying, I need the sheet, I need the sheet. The other thing that really sets apart beginners from more intermediate and advanced players is timing. So groove and rhythm are the most important things. Rhythm is the most primary musical element that we have, right? From our heartbeat, keeping a tempo, to dancing, which even children do, rhythm is everything. And the thing that keeps all the music together is the beat, right? If anyone misses a beat, it's like a heart palpitation. It'll stop you in your tracks. I don't know, if you ever had a heart palpitation, you know, like it, it just, no matter, it, it just pulls you right out of the moment. If you're in the middle of a conversation and you have a heart palpitation, you just, excuse me, what's going on, <laughs> right? Like that's how it is in music. If someone is missing the beat or is off the beat, the whole band gets so pulled out of the element, right? So how do you develop really good timing? Best thing to do is get really good at playing simple music. Don't try to go to like, the mountaintop and just be really sloppy trying to play really fancy stuff. See if you could play simple things really, really good. Can you take a simple chord progression and have a good groove? So we did C, G, E minor, F. A minor, F. 
right? Can you just keep a really strong groove there? And how do you know if you're keeping a really strong groove? We'll try to play with something that is a groove, like a metronome, right? So here I have this metronome going, and that's just my drummer, my very simple drummer. I'm gonna groove with my drummer on C, G, A minor, F. Right, and in order to do that, you have to develop some fluidity in your right hand, right? Of course, you need to develop your left hand, but the right hand is what's gonna generate the rhythm. So you see, I'm just keeping that constant down up motion. Practicing your riffs with the beat. So again, if we went to that, back to that rhythm. Right, so that was that little riff I showed you earlier. Now with a metronome, you see it's so locked in with that metronome. Then trying to define for yourself, well, where is it coming in? One, two, three, and it's coming in on the end of three. One, and two, and three, and four, and one and two, and three, and four, and one. Notice also how I'm doing three things at once there. I'm tapping, it's not really a metronome. It's a foot tambourine. So I'm tapping with my foot, I'm counting with my mouth, and I'm playing with my fingers, right? So that's kind of from teaching from a long, for a long time. I kind of have developed that. It's kind of like being a drummer. But you want to be able to tap that beat, internalize that beat, while you play. So even what I'm doing with this foot tambourine, you should be doing with the ground. So you should be able to play that riff while tapping your foot. One, two, three. A lot of times I see people learn a solo and they play all the notes right, but then they'll put on say a metronome or a backing track and the their placement of the phrases has nothing to do with the drums or the chords. It's like, why'd you even put on the backing track if you're not gonna play with it? But the reason is because they don't know. They don't know how it fits with the backing track. So that brings me to the other thing, which goes along with ear training, which is actually playing along to the recordings, right? So you want to, if you're learning, let's say a solo or a phrase, you want to match exactly how it sounds on the recording. Now, this is not to say that you want to become a carbon copy of a player. It just means that you want to have the musicianship to play something exactly as you learned it. Then use your creativity to change it, but don't change it because you can't play it. Change it for the sake of creativity, but play it exact to develop your musicianship and your phrasing. Your scales with metronomes. Playing right on the beat. Right, so everything, boo, ga, boo, ga, like a machine, right? Now, we're not gonna play like a machine when it comes time to play, but we want to have that machinery working in the background that keeps us tight onto the beat. How do we get it? By learning how to relate to the beat using a metronome, using drum tracks. And that brings me to my next tip, playing with others. So other people, right? When we are playing alone in our room, it's hard to develop a great sense of timing and other aspects of musicianship, which go along with playing with others. and Ultimately, music is something social, right? The only reason we've ever heard any music in our life is because someone played it for us or recorded it for us, right? For us, it's, a, it's something to be enjoyed by others. It's not supposed to just be something you do by yourself. Now, if, if you love doing it by yourself, that's great. But even you're, you're lying if you're saying that because even if you're playing along to a recording, you feel like you're playing with others. You feel like you're connecting with someone else. Even if it's just a drum track, there's a, a robot drummer there that you're relating to, right? Uh, of course, if we play solo, 
you know, solo guitar, it's, you are only doing it for yourself, but wouldn't it be really magical that someone else could experience the enjoyment that you experience and you, and it's that infectious, you know, what you feel when you're playing that is infectious. That's the beauty of being an artist is that in one sense, it's a, it's something we do for ourselves, but ultimately we want to put beauty out in the world, right? Anyway, I'm getting really philosophical, but playing with others. So by playing with others, there's so many things that go along with this. One is accountability. Hey, let's meet next Friday and let's play these three songs. Boom. I have a deadline. I don't want to make a fool of myself. I don't want to be the weakest link. I want to make sure that the song goes from the beginning to the end without me having to stop and say, wait. So accountability. The next thing is when you're in that room, that energy, that union between you and the other people that are playing, that brings out something in you that does not exist alone in a room. There's this adrenaline, there's this energy, there's this heightened awareness. You become a little bit superhuman when you play more with others. Magic things happen. Uh, I, I, My teacher when I was younger said like, an hour playing on stage is worth, you know, 10 hours alone in your practice room or something like that, right? So it's just, there's so much more room for growth. Also, when you play with people that are better than you, you know exactly what you need to do when you go home, right? You might be playing with other people and they call out these chords and you don't know how to find the chords and, you know, or you're slow on the fretboard. Now, you know, okay, I got to go home. I got to memorize the fretboard. I didn't know how to play that chord. Uh, they asked me to take a solo. I had no idea what key, <laughs> you know, like you just learn what you need to do as a result of playing with others. You also understand how to fit into a mix when you play with others, how to control your volume, how to play around with your tone. Do I have too much bass, too much treble? Uh, do I need some overdrive in this part? You know, how do I create contrast? How do I go from louder to softer? Oh, there's a singer. Am I overpowering the singer? So there's just all these opportunities to develop new skills when you play with others. All right, my fourth tip, develop your repertoire and your vocabulary. So a lot of people that are starting out falsely assume that they have to learn everything there is about the guitar, how it works, the whole guitar layout, all the different chords that there are, the different scales. Meanwhile, they don't know any songs or riffs, right? Like that's completely backwards if we go back to the language analogy where when we learn language, first we learn how to communicate and have conversations before we learn anything about grammar. We learn it unconsciously. We learn the rules of grammar without actually defining them just because we understand common practice among the people we're talking to, our family or our friends, right? So it's the same with language. We can learn the rules without actually knowing them just by developing our ear and responding to uh, what we hear. So you could think of vocabulary and repertoire as the equivalent of sentences and ideas in language, right? So what's great about a song is it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then it's over, right? So that's really straightforward. Either I can play the song or I can't play the song. It's a very clear beginning, middle, and end. I'm starting to learn the song. I know most of the song. I know all the song, right? Uh, and through the process of learning the song, you're developing all these new skills. Now, what does it mean to really know a song? You could play it from start to finish. Uh, try to work on repertoire that you could play perfectly. Perfect, right? Start with simple repertoire that you could play along with the recording, right? There's some musicians, they play really simple things, you know? Back to just like a... You know, that right there, if I just, if I went to an open mic night and I went, here, here's my song. I've got a G chord to a C chord. I've got a G to a D. You know, I'm playing a song and I'm just playing these simple chords, but I meet people that might know all these scales. Hey, look what I could do. And then I say, okay, play me G, C, D. And it's like, 
you know, it's all disjointed, right? So you want to start with simple things. Vocabulary. So people often say, all right, I know the pentatonic scale, but I don't know what to play in it. Well, what did Jimi Hendrix play in it, right? This is not a Jimi Hendrix riff, but it's inspired by Jimi Hendrix. So, uh, right, so that's a lick. So let's say you heard Jimi Hendrix play that. I don't think he ever played that exactly like that. But so you hear it, again, you use your ear, maybe you figure it out by ear. Then you figure out, well, what is it? Okay, it's in the key of A, A minor pentatonic, and it's in this first pattern. And then it comes time for you to solo in the key of A. Here's my loop. Then I could use that vocabulary to not say it exactly the same, but develop it, right? So how many ways could I play that, that lick? So now that little piece of vocabulary becomes creative fuel. Like how many times could I say the same thing? It's just like language. So if I want to say, I really like to eat chili, right? I really like to eat chili. Oh, I feel so good when someone serves me a bowl of chili. Nothing makes me more happy than putting some sour cream and onion in a bowl of chili and chowing down bowl after bowl. So see, I'm getting really into it. I'm saying the same thing. I'm just playing with that thought. And it's the same thing with a musical phrase. So the best way to get stuff for your solos is go out and learn the phrases of the people that really inspire you and then develop those phrases. And then you'll never run out of things to say. Just learn, learn to say the things you want to say and then say them your own way. My next tip is to try to become a well-rounded player. And what does that mean? Rhythm and lead. You wanna be able to play both those things. So you just saw me use a looper. So if I wanna work on soloing in the key of G, well then let me play a chord progression in the key of G. Now I could work on playing chords in the key of G too. And I could play them in various ways, like maybe let's go G, A minor, to C. First I'll play it open chords. Then I'll play it as bar chords, you know, something like that. One, two, three, four. Right? So by using the looper, you're developing your rhythm skills, you're developing your lead on top of it, and you're also developing that whole playing well with others thing, even though it's you playing with yourself, right? And that's really it. I'll say for me, the way that I made the jump from beginner player to professional player was by learning how to play songs and playing them with others. Right, I grew up in the grunge era, so I'm a 90s kid. And it was easy to learn Nirvana songs and Smashing Pumpkins and Green Day. And a lot of that grunge rock was very simple as a kind of response to a lot of that hair metal stuff of the 80s, right? Which was a little more complicated, probably a lot of that. Uh, but as a kid, that was a way for me to get together with other amateur musicians as a teenager and play these simple songs, right? And it was all about just hitting the chord at the right time, hitting the note at the right time. 
everyone locking in together. And then when I got a little older, I studied music in college, but then it was the same thing, just on a bigger level, uh, playing with others, learning a set list of songs, playing in a cover band helped me a lot. I still play in a wedding band uh, and just learning lots of repertoire. And by learning lots of repertoire of different styles, you're learning all these different skills. And the last thing that really ties it all together is when you do learn the theory, the theory is not the first thing you should learn, but when you do, you then understand the context of the songs you learn. Is it minor? Is it major? What's the chord progression? It's a one, two, four progression. Oh, look at that. We've got a minor four chord back to the one. Oh, that happened in that other song I listened to. Oh, right. All these songs are one, six, four, five. They're very similar. We can make a medley out of those songs. Oh, these riffs, these are major pentatonic riffs. Oh, but right there, it's, you know, it's a modal thing. They're doing the mixolydian mode. Oh, that sounds like that other song. Right. They both use that mode, right? You start, so things start to connect and you start to understand the context of the music. But that is not what you should start with. You should start with learning the sounds themselves. Listen, respond, learn to recreate the sounds and then expand on the sounds to get creative. You can get really, really creative with not knowing anything about the grammar, AKA the theory, but know that once you start to feel comfortable enough to play songs, now you could start going deeper into the understanding of how it all kind of works. What's, you know, getting inside the machinery. All right, everybody, I hope that was helpful. I know a lot of that was kind of a, a long rant, but to me, those are the things that really set apart beginners and more advanced people is, how's your ear? Do you have rock solid timing? Are you able to get up on stage with others and play a song or just take out your guitar and play a song? Uh, when you improvise, are you working from some vocabulary that you've worked out? D do I hear your influences or are you just kind of meandering aimlessly through a scale, right? well-rounded. You can play rhythm, you could play lead, we could trade off. Able to play simple things really, really well. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. If you want to learn more about playing guitar, head over to guitartricks.com for step-by-step -step sequential courses and a library of in-depth song lessons with multi-video lessons, downloadable tab, backing tracks, all that good stuff. Happy playing, and I'll see you in the next lesson. <laughs>